again. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm just so happy to be back with you again so that we can spread the word and get out there and do kingdom building for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope you've had a good week. We know that all things are working together for the good for those who love the Lord. So whether things have not been so good, God is still working it out. So we just praise God for this beautiful day that He has made and that He has allowed us to be in so that we can be even more available for His kingdom building. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, our lives, our health, and our strength. And Lord, we just ask that you help us as we go into your word. Help us to decrease, Lord, and help me to decrease and you increase, Lord, so that your word may go forth to some heart that's broken, to some soul that needs to be saved, to some soul that needs to be strengthened and delivered. Lord, forgive us of anything we said, thought, or done that was not pleasing in your sight. Lord, help us to be good vessels for you. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel and all other countries all over this world. We pray for all the world leaders. And Lord, we especially pray for that war that's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Lord, it hurts our heart to see those things happening. But you said it would happen. You said that there would be wars and there would be rumors of more wars. But Lord, you told us in your word not to faint because you're with us. Help those families, Lord, who are bereaved at this moment, who have lost loved ones. Let them know that they too will have to go through this. But you sent the great comfort of the Holy Spirit, and he is there to comfort, to lead, and to guide. Help us this day, Lord. We pray, Lord, for all of our families, all of our friends, and Lord, even our enemies too. And Lord, just continue to help us and help us, Lord, to love, truly love, unconditionally. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask of all these things. Amen. I just thank God for this day. And I too want to say, and I didn't mention it, that we lift up all the ministers and all those who are inside the wall and outside the wall on the mission field. Because I tell you, this is a time that the word need to go forth. Need to go forth. Because we're in perilous times. You may not know what time it is. But it's perilous time. It's serious time. God is soon to come back. And he wants to receive us as his own. Are you ready? Get ready. Because time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. But will you be ready when the bridegroom comes? I just thank God for saving our soul. And you know that we're getting ready to go into the celebration of what Jesus did for us so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Last week, we were talking about the Passover supper with his disciples. And we're going back a little bit because now we're even talking about, even before that happened, how the people were rejoicing and happy because they thought that Jesus was coming here on earth to be the king at that particular time. So we're going to talk about that today. And the today's lesson is called The Triumphal Entry into Jer Jerusalem. The Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem. And it's taken from Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 11. The Triumphal Entry into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And you know, that's why we have to be 
really asking the Lord to lead God and direct us. Because you know, one day a person could be praising you, and then the next day they could be putting you down. So we have to stay focused in Jesus. Stay focused on who we're doing it for. Okay. I'd like to give you a little background on what we're going to be studying today. The Messiah. That's who Jesus is. And it means the word anointed one. In Hebrew is the title Meshachai or Messiah or the Greek Christos or Christ. Since apostolic times the name Christ has become the proper title of Jesus whom Christians recognize as the God given Redeemer of Israel and the church. Church's Lord Christ or Messiah is therefore a name admired suited to express both the church's link with Israel through the Old Testament and the faith that sees the worldwide scope of salvation in him. The Jewish Messiah was expected to be a warrior prince who would expel the hated Romans from Israel and bring in a kingdom in which the Jews would be promoted to world dominion. However, some of the messianic prophecies showed him as more of a priest. The alternative between a kingly messiah and a priestly figure is characteristics of the two centuries of early Judaism prior to the coming of Jesus. So see, the Jews was looking for the princely kingdom here. But there was one that they wasn't expecting. They was expecting Jesus to come and set things in order then, now. But we're going to find out. The significance of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was such that all four Gospels, Matthew, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would make the record of it as it was time for the Passover. Over two million Jewish inhabitants of the land made the annual pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the feast and celebration. One could speculate this was the most excellent moment for the Messiah to make himself known to so many of people at this time. The symbolic focus of sacrifice was before them and he would present himself as the ultimate sacrifice. Matthew's Gospel records includes 41 prophetic quotes from the Old Testament which confirm Jesus as the Messiah. The people had seen others who professed to be the Messiah, the conqueror of the land, the warrior set to overthrow for the ruling government. They were all too familiar with possessions of great wars, horses, and armies entering cities. They did not, however, expect a humble entrance of a king riding on an animal that was a symbol of quietness, humility, and goodwill. Still, though, they knew this was the Messiah and gave him a king's welcome, replete with an unridden coat, a copper of garments off their backs, a pathway of palm leaves, and shouts of praise which rang out into the streets. Jesus ushers us, ushered in as a king, knew this was the end of his earthly life. 
and the beginning of his eternal reign. Jesus regarded as an agitator faced the host hostile religious leaders knowing that before the festival was ended his blood would be on their hands. Jesus entered the town of his trial assured of his triumph. Jesus knew his time was at hand. And the people were praising because they was looking for him to take over and to take charge then. But he knew that his task on this earth was just about over. And he was getting ready to do the ultimate task was to make himself the sacrifice for all mankind. Our first segment of the lesson will be presence of the prophet. Presence of the prophet. And it's taken from again, as I say, Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 7. And it reads like this. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethlehem, unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples. There he is again. You know, last week he sent two disciples to ask them to go and, and ask for a place where he could eat dinner for, with them, the Passover supper. So he sent two again so that he could ask uh, them about transportation into the city. Saying unto them, this is what he said, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. Jesus is saying to the disciples, the two disciples, Go to Bethridge on the Mount of Olives. And go ahead and go into the village over there and tell them as soon as you enter in, you will see a donkey tied there and this coat beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, you will say, well, Jesus was, you know, well, we, we know he is a man of authority. He was a man of authority and we know that he is in authority now. But these people are aware of Jesus, okay? It's not like they just didn't know him. They had seen the miracles that he had done. He had a reputation. That's why there was no problem when he told them to go do certain things and they, they did it. Because the people had seen what works he was doing, the miracles that he had performed. So Jesus had a following. And he also had the naysayers, the, the, the dignitaries, who did not understand or was jealous of the work that he was doing. Verse 3 says, And if any man, look, look, this is what he's saying, And if any man say all unto you, ye shall say, The Lord have need of them, and straightway he will send them. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. Like I said, he had a good reputation. And he said, if anybody give you, ask you, well, what are you doing with them? Just tell them that the Lord, just tell them that Jesus sent you. Verse 4 says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughters of Zion, Jerusalem, Behold, thou king cometh unto thee. And you know how he came? Meek and sitting upon the donkey 
and a coat the fowl of the donkey. So Jesus is not, we, all, we said even last week, that he didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. Jesus read the Old Testament too. Actually, that's when it, you know, he was reading from there. And he went exactly like the prophets of old had said he would do. So he knew that he was supposed to come into that city of Jerusalem in a meek and mild way. That's what the scripture said, foretold. And he was carrying it out, not doing away with it, but carrying it out the way they had put it in the scriptures. Verse 6 says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. Verse 7 says, And bought the donkey and the coat, and put on their coats, and put on their clothes, and they set him their own. So when they went and got the donkey and her fowl, they put coats on him so that he could have a better ride. And so that Jesus could sit there. Now, we're going to see that Jesus truly is a meek person. He didn't, he could have said, well, go, go get me a big white horse and all of this stuff. No, he wanted to show that he was the people's people. He did not want to be up like that, which we know he is and was. But he wanted to be able to reach out to these people, to the poor, to whoever wanted to come and worship him. Jesus sent two disciples to secure a donkey to ride into Jerusalem in order to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah. It is possible that Jesus made arrangements beforehand to have a donkey and her coat ready for his use. But it's also possible that only his reputation preceded him. I would like to think that it's his reputation. Because you can ask a person, but if a person don't feel good about you, they're not going to let you have what they have. But they saw that this was a special man. That he was doing some things that had ne some miraculous things that had never done been done before. When the owner of the donkey and the colt learned that Jesus requested them, he gave them freely. What is most significant is that Jesus chose, Jesus chose a humble animal to ride into the city, not a mighty war horse with muscles of great masses and strength leading a procession of highly trained warriors armed with breastplates of brass and plans for battle. Jesus rode on a coat, a symbol of humility, which made his entry and crucifixion forever memorable. But the presence of a king on a coat did not keep the people from praising him. They perceived the prophet among them and greeted him as king. When I read that, I said, Lord, help us. God does not like pride. He does not like when we think we're more than what we should or think we are. We should always seek to be humble. 
Even sometimes people may think that you're a pushover. No. There's strength in humility. There's strength in meekness. There's strength in temperance. If you go off on the handle all the time, you may go off, but you're not going to be listened to because people turn you off. And the most important thing, when we show humility, we're not taking matters in our own hand, especially if you're a child of God. You're saying, let me be still. And Lord, let me speak or let me be there when you want me to. You go before me. Because we know that whatever situation the Lord wants you to do, He's always there with you. And you know what? He goes there before you to make the path clear. So that you'll be able to do the work that He has asked you to do. So I thank God. Thank Jesus for His humility. He didn't go in there with a great big horse for all these muscles and intimidating people. He went on a little quiet, humble donkey. And he had the little fowl following behind. I don't know why the, the little donkey was there. The baby. Maybe it was still nursing or whatever from his mother. But it followed. But then I like to think that Jesus was on that donkey riding and that little fowl was seeing too that his mother was carrying our Lord and our Savior following our Lord and our Savior and his mother we too need to be followers of Christ and not of men. The second segment of our lesson, and this is a short lesson this week, is the possession, possession of the people. The possession of the people. And it's taken from verses 8 through 11. And this is what happened. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and straw them in the way. Means that they took off their garments and they placed them on the, on the donkey. And then even put it in the street. Some of them took the clothes and, and laid it in the street. Others cut down palm trees, leaves, and put it in the street so that Jesus could ride on ease. Because see, you got to think that's a hilly place. And all those cobbles, stones in the street, they wanted him to enter in on a smooth surface, on a soft surface. That's what they did for him. Because you see, if it would have been Caesar and them, they would have rolled out the red carpet or whatever carpet they had. But Jesus, the people's king, they didn't have all of that. But they made provisions for what they did have. And they wanted to make sure that he rode easily and that he didn't have to worry about rocks being in the way. They pulled off their clothes. Some of them put their garments in the street, and some of them who did not have that, they put down the leaves from the palm tree for our Lord and Savior entering into Jerusalem. And it said, And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. 
who sat in the highest. Jesus was in the center of the possession. And the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. Hosanna. They were so happy. They were giving him praise and giving him acknowledgement. They acknowledged that he was from the lineage of the son of David. But then they went a little bit further and said, He is the son of God, the Lord of the highest. Praise God for the highest in heaven. They thought about his earthly reign, lineage. But then they thought about his true lineage in heaven. Verse 10 says, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude, verse 11 says, And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Who is this? Who is this that's got all of this commotion? Who is this that they're ushering in? Putting stuff in the street so that he won't have to walk or the donkey won't have to stumble and fall. Who is this? Why is he getting all of this recognition? And they said, and the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowd threw down their coats and branches along the road and shouted praise to him. Their actions honored him and they greeted Jesus with shouts and songs taken from the Psalms 118 26 that were customary greetings to people journeying to Jerusalem for the Passover. However, the people knew Jesus was much more than just another traveler. They were honoring him for the miracles they had seen him perform. The throngs of people, the fear of that the Messiah had come. And the deafening shout of praise created a momentum in the city that could be seen, felt, and heard. So they just didn't do it quietly. They didn't say, Hosanna, praise God. They were so overjoyed until they shouted. It said that it made such a rus ruckus the people said, who is this? Why are they making all of this noise? But they were happy that they were ushering in. Leading this procession, listen to this, were children, not soldiers. There's still humility now. Humility. Children were leading the procession not soldiers, who sang his praise and shouted his glory. Jesus is proclaimed as the son of David, the rightful ruler of Israel and fulfillment of God's ancient covenant with David. They welcome him as coming in the name of the Lord with the Lord God's full power and authority. The people of Jerusalem were excited and asked about Jesus' identity. Most of Jesus' ministry has been done outside of Jerusalem. 
to avoid agitating the Jewish leaders. But now, these same people to whom he had ministered were leading the procession into the city. And the city dwellers wanted to know about the king who sat on a coat and not on a throne. The crowd replied that he was the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Even though Galilee was out of the way and Nazareth was such a small town, the crowd did not mind making it known that such a great prophet came from obscurity. We had best acknowledge Jesus. And you know, he came in on a donkey. The possession was being led by little children. And I like to say this, be careful how you treat little children. A lot of people think because they're small or they're in, insignificant. There's nothing. They, they don't know any better. But you can remember, if you can, if you're old enough, things that happened to you in your younger days. Jesus, during this time, he too, uh, with his disciples, when he was healing and, 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 and doing all these things, and the children would run up to him and disciples would kind of Scold him. And Jesus said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. Do not reprimand these children for coming to me. And Jesus received them. And then after he loved on them and assured them, he told his disciples, if you don't come home but like them, you won't enter in. So you must become humble, a childlike. Have childlike faith. Jesus does not, the Bible does not tell us to have grown up faith. The more we become a child in Christ, He will mature us. But you know, even in that maturity, He will still keep us a base, He will still humble us. But we must become to Him, we must come to Him. As a child. So that he can mold and make us. And those children. Remember Jesus. I believe they remembered. How nice and kind he was to them. And when the grown ups would say. You need to go. You step back. You know. You're not important. Jesus said. Uh uh. You let them come. You let them come to me. Suffer them. Suffer the little children not to come to me. Don't rebuke them. And if you don't humble yourself as these little children, you won't enter in. So, we have to be careful in how we treat the least and the old. Really everybody. But don't take advantage of a person because they're younger. Or because their mental is not like yours. God honors them. God loves them just like he loves you. Don't discount them. Because we'll be surprised. We'll be surprised. Of what God has. In store for us in heaven. Those people. Who may not have all their mental normalcy here on this earth. Actually, we all got some problems. But it's only through Christ. That's why he tells us, if you keep your mind on him, he'll keep you in perfect peace. But something can happen to you right like that. And you forget. Or you, 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 you lose thoughts and memories and things. 
But keep your mind stayed on Christ. Keep yourself humble. But I believe that those people, along like the little children, they have a special place in heaven because they have childlike faith. I want to have a special place too with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I ask the Lord, keep me humble. And a song that the consoles used to sing when I were here and I went back and, and uh, got them on YouTube, the consolers, husband and wife uh, team, used to say, if I'm too high, Lord, please bring me down. Bring me down so that I can be humble. Hi, I'm back. I had a little difficulty with our te technology here. <coughs> but as I was saying, we need to be humble before Christ. And we're going to conclude with our 11th verse. And then when it was saying that we know that he was a great, he is a great prophet. But I want to say this and read this. Matthew presents Jerusalem in a very negative light. At the beginning of the gospel, Jerusalem is where King Herod reigns and calls for Jesus and all the young boys of Bethlehem to be murdered. Later, Joseph moves his family from Bethlehem near Jerusalem to Nazareth because Herod son of Archelaus is king in Jerusalem. Early in Jesus' ministry, when Jerusalem politics land John the Baptist in jail, Jesus moves his ministry north to Galilee. Matthew does not record Jesus returning anywhere near Jerusalem until this point. This is perhaps why the people of Jerusalem do not know who Jesus is. To answer to their question, Jesus' followers call him a prophet. For the most part, the title prophet refers to an Old Testament check character. And John the Baptist was a prophet quoting prophets and using prophetic words, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The New Testament is a book fulfilling the words spoken by prophets. Though Jesus is called rabbi eight times throughout the gospel, he is called prophet about a dozen times. Of course, Jesus also quoted Old Testament prophets. A prophet's role was to speak truth to power and deliver God's word to the people. They might work miracles or warn of coming troubles. All of these does, all of these Jesus does as a prophet. It's not an incorrect title for him because he fulfilled the law. It merely stops short of acknowledging his full title, which is the Messiah. So we see again that Jesus did not do away with the law. He quoted those scriptures. John the Baptist did too. But Jesus took it a little bit further. He fulfilled, he fulfilled what was spoken to Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all those prophets of old. He fulfilled what was to come. When he was on that cross, and before he gave up the ghost, he said it's finished. Not the death part, but it was finished of what he came to do for the will of his father for the will of us, so that we may 
have life more abundantly. I thank God that he's more than a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I pray that you've gotten something out of this lesson. I have. Sorry for the little delay there. But we know that sometimes things happen. But God's word will go forth. And we just thank God for him. Uh, the next week's lesson would be the pastoral lamb live. The pastoral lamb live. And it's taken from Matthew again. The 28th chapter. Verses 1 through 10. Matthew the 28th chapter, verses 1 through 10. The pastoral lamb lives. Yes, he does. So we'll see you, if God's will, on next week. Ready for another lesson. And you know next week is going to be a beautiful week. Every day is. It's the day of Thanksgiving. But it's the day that we will be celebrating our Lord and Savior when he got up from the grave and he reigns forevermore. It will be Easter Sunday on next Sunday, Palm Sunday this Sunday. So we just thank God for being God and being God all by himself. I love you my brother, I love you my sister, and let's continue to pray that we may grow and grow in the grace of God. And like us on Facebook, like us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. And continue, most of all, to pray for us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and pray for all other churches, all of those who are out in the ministry, proclaiming the word of God. Because if we ever needed the Lord, we sure do need him now. Love you, and hope to see you again, if it's God's will, on next week. Be blessed. See you next time.